Okay. So like Wayne said, um, I'm going to focus my talk on one of the items listed in his conference call, right? The, uh, the part focusing on notions of transience and perpetuity from the point of view of a conservator who always tries to um, make things last longer. Uh, and you can, see the, you can see the blurb there on the slide. And at the same time, I'm going to ask questions such as, how do you conserve a concept that is embedded in the material fabric of objects? How do you make sure that material considered sacred is treated with the respect it deserves? And how you can conciliate market trends, financial values, and artist's intention? <clears throat> And what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to use a range of case studies from uh, conservation of uh, indigenous collections and contemporary art to bring out the point that there should be more collaboration between these two sub-disciplines because we're doing lots of things that uh, are important, that, that are in common. So first of all, um, I want to start by exploring some of the similarities of, uh, that occur in the conservation of these two kind of collections. So both fields are immensely broad, very difficult to define, and permeated by tangible and intangible productions. The collections are characterized by extensive ranges of organic and inorganic materials. In both cases, materials have been increasingly uh, being replaced by mo modern counterparts, especially in the uh, last few decades. And this may or may not have been manufactured to be used artistically, or even, uh, you know, and many times they're protected by legislation that obstructs uh, understanding and research. So you spend a lot of time trying to find out what those materials are made of. Um, Another similarity between the two, the two kinds of collections is that uh, some, many times the materials used in the, in the objects are incompatible in terms of uh, aging properties, but they are still, still combined in the manufacture. Uh, another important point is that both indigenous and contemporary art are, of course, usually embedded in complex networks of meanings and uh, values. It's also interesting from my point of view to notice that museum professionals associated with both fields have been particularly been, uh, have been particularly interested in more participatory and inclusive processes in the decision making uh, concerning stewardship. And also that the interest groups associated with these collections are becoming more and more vocal. Unfortunately, these kind of collaborations do not happen as often as they should, and this is probably one of the reasons why it's not unusual to find contemporary art that has been conserved in a manner that goes against its very concept, or its essence. Uh, most of these cases relate to material that should have been allowed to deteriorate or decompose and eventually disappear, so follow its natural cycle of, exi of existence. But for whatever reason, in that context, it was decided that it should be subjected to a treatment that would slow down or change this uh, cycle. Likewise, it's very common to see objects considered sacred by their originators being displayed along secular objects or in circumstances that may desecrate or devalue them. So in order to explore the question of how long these collections should last, or whether they should really last very long. We have to start considering why we preserve collections, how long uh, we should preserve them for, and we usually use the word the future when we try to elaborate on these ideas. So I'm always very curious about uh, what the future means. So there has been some research focused on this subject, and a few years ago, William Lindsay conducted a survey in some London museums to find out some evidence for uh, different perceptions of what the future means, right? So he found that the expectations will vary according to the age of the collection, um, <clears throat> the perceived deterioration rate of the materials present in the collections, 
the kind of material that they are made of, the artistic intent, and of course, what I, meant, uh, what I mentioned as the, the future, what the future means. For most respondents to the survey, uh, the future meant a point 100 years from now, but that will of course vary according to your age. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, <clears throat> so to start with the, my examples, I want, to, I want to highlight here that the conservation literature is full of, uh, of articles and treatments that uh, try to stop or deal with deterioration. So we try, uh, we try to conserve deterioration. And here you're going to understand what I mean. So the fact is that deterioration and decay are so fascinating and uh, so intrinsic to our nature that many contemporary artists use it as the main concept of their work or as a means to achieve that concept. So what to say, for example, of the, the image you have uh, on the slide there, Ages of the World. So it's an installation by Anselm Kiefer that was at the Royal Academy last year. And uh, I, I was uh, very entertained by the label that described it uh, as saying uh, mixed media. And as you can see on the slide, it consists of a large number of canvases and uh, they're all stacked on each other and each of the canvases or one work by itself so they're finished works uh, and there are uh, there are layers of plants pieces of metal textiles dust and whatever you can think in there um, on the exhibition's audio i heard Kiefer saying that after the painting after he paints a canvas he takes it outside his studio and he leaves it there for a couple of years According to him, the painting continues to do its thing. So that is, it has to start deteriorating before he considers uh, the, the painting uh, ready for display. And for that, what I'm very interested in is that he uses an inverse approach of conservation, what is sometimes called uh, anti-conservation. Uh, so for him, deterioration itself is a vehicle of expression. And the question here is, does it matter if we stop the deterioration, so if we stop the decay? Um, I would go further and say that I learned a lot from Kiefer's work, because his work is populated by lessons about salt damage, corrosion mechanisms, aid, all agents of deterioration are in action in there. Uh, and he tries always to put the uh, organic and in, or inorganic materials that are very reactive to each other together. Uh, in the next slide, you can see some more detail of, um, of his work and how deterioration is important in there. So of course, he learned a lot from his mentor, Joseph Boyce, who in my understanding was a master of combining compatible materials. Today, as conservators, we're left with the challenges of conserving his work that in order to survive would either have to be consolidated so heavily that chemically it would be completely changed, even though it might still have the same appearance. Or the other option would be to replace the original materials with replicas. Both options, by the way, go against what boys would like to be, uh, to be done, because he was, of course, very opinionated and vocal about his uh, about his work and left a lot of writings and testimonies about what should be done. So the point highlight, being highlighted here is that deterioration may, in so many cases, bring completeness or uh, closure to a process related to a work of art or a sacred object. A different, a different example relating to allowing things um, to decay, so allowing completeness, uh, is related to the Pueblo Zuni in New Mexico in the United States and their efforts to repatriate twin images of Ahayuda, colloquially known as the war gods. This is, of course, one of the classics in the literature. So images of Ahayuda have traditionally been carved out of wood and uh, used in ritual initiations and commemorations as symbols of courage, strength, and protection. 
They are supposed to be placed in special shrines around the Zuni Pueblo when they are replaced by all, uh, when they replace older images. So then the older images are retired and taken to another shrine where they're supposed to be allowed to decay and complete the process. At least 80 of these images were repatriated to the Zuni between 1978 and 95, which gives an idea of the, the size of the collections. Uh, still, there are many Zuni ritual objects in collections today and even being uh, offered in auctions. So a couple of years ago, or last year actually, the Drut auction uh, um, house in Paris was involved in various controversial sales that were const contested by the Zuni, the Hopi, the Navajo nations, and backed by the US State Department. Uh, as the efforts to stop the auctions in December 2014 were in vain, then the Navajo Nation purchased seven sacred objects from the auction house. A uh, similar move had been made in 2013 uh, when the Annenberg Foundation intervened and purchased a number of Hopi artifacts and then gave it back to the, to the Hopi. Another successful, uh, another successful approach museums have found, as already uh, suggested here, relates to the use of replicas, and more recently, 3D scanning, imaging, and printing. Again, this is often found in both kinds of collections, in the, uh, the conservation of both kinds of collections. So to illustrate this, I want to mention another milestone uh, of the literature relating to the Glasgow dance shirt uh, and its repatriation to the Lakota people. As you probably remember, the shirt was proven to have been originated from the Lakota and uh, to have been worn by a Sioux uh, warrior in the Wounded Knee Massacre in 1890. It's made of cotton fabric and adorned with feathers of various birds that have different meanings. Uh, more significantly than that, it bears blood stains and holes believed to have been caused by bullets uh, during the massacre. The shirt had been the property of the MacLillan Galleries in Glasgow since uh, 1891, but was moved to the Kevin Grove Museum later. After a four-year campaign, the Wounded Knee Survivors Association, by the Wounded Knee Survivors Association, it was re returned to the Lakota in 99. The return involved celebrations <clears throat> uh, with the, the Lakota to which representatives from the Glasgow uh, Museum were invited and where Marcella Lebeau, so granddaughter of one of those present in the massacre, presented the museum with another shirt she made herself. Um, the, what I'm interested about this is actually the impact of the replica, because of course the books of the museum are full of uh, um, comments, very positive comments in relation to the repatriation, but it is the, the replica today is a highlight in the museum, so when you get into the museum, the first thing you see is a sign uh, um, about the shirt going that way, you know, so it's like the Mona Lisa of the museum in there. Well, um, <coughs> Now I'm going to use uh, an another example from contemporary art. So in this case, the physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living by Damien Hirst, which I'm sure everybody knows here, just to highlight a different facet of what we may, um, we may consider ideal. So the original work was created in 91 and started deteriorating heavily by the 2000s when you uh, visited that you would think that death was quite a possibility because the shark was deteriorating, visibly deteriorating. Sometimes you would even see parts of it falling apart, uh, falling off the shark. So death looked like quite a possibility in there. So before selling it to a collector in the US, Hearst commissioned the new shark and replaced the, the old deteriorating one. So in this case, um, pristine condition was essential for his work. Um, I should also add that I don't really know what happened to the old shark, whether he, um, he keeps it somewhere or not. Um, my. Okay, another example this time, Ai Weiwei, ooh, five minutes, yeah. Um, 
just to show, so here is a contemporary art acting irresponsibly, like somebody uh, mentioned here. Well, they are allowed to do that, right? So he is on display at the Royal Academy now. And as you all know, besides being highly politically engaged, he's a deep connoisseur of materials and a collector as well. One of the rooms of the exhibition has his interventions with Neolithic pots. So you can see here at the back, uh, in the background, you can see him dropping some Neolithic pots of about 3,000 years of age. Uh, and then the other pots in the foreground, um, the also 3,000 year old pots that he uh, painted with industrial paint. In the same room, there is uh, Coca-Cola and also From Dust to Dust, in which he went to extremes and actually crushed a collection of Neolithic vases and then put them in clear, gla in, uh, clear glass containers in the shelf. Um, <clears throat> so what could we say uh, about him? Perhaps he is alluding to contemporary values of authenticity and even asking collectors or museum visitors what is more valuable, so the antiquity or the hand of a contemporary artist like him. Um, at the same time, so here you have more of his actions. Um, at the same time, he seems to be alluding to how China is losing its ties with uh, uh, its past. And uh, some, although I have a very positive uh, view on his work, some have called him vandal, destroyer of antiquities uh, and Chinese heritage. No, so, um, well, but what to say about the, the collector who bought one of the Coca-Cola vases so that he could also drop it and smash it against the floor. And then he filmed it. And OK, so the last example that I'm going to use here, just to close, uh, is to show that uh, we also have, besides conserving things, we also have an, may have another kind of imp other kinds of impact that are not always foreseen. So I was very uh, many years ago. I worked in a project in uh, San Cristobal de Rapaz in Peru, and uh, to conserve the quipu of that village, you can see them behind the comuneros in the picture in there. So for those who don't know, quipu are rare textiles, uh, textile artifacts composed of knotted cords and cotton wool, and uh, they are related to uh, Inca practices. So it's a very interesting um, context in there. But the reason why I wanted to show is this, is that after, after finishing the project, uh, I made uh, a web page for it, and then I was very surprised. Well, I knew that some artists had been inspired by Kipu in the past, like the one in the, on the screen there, Jorge Yeltsin. But I was very surprised to find out that this artist from um, Ireland, Kingling Morris, uh, actually inspired her work in the, in the conservation work that we had done on the Kipu. So all this to say that in working with this kind of collections, we have to have open minds, uh, creativity, and be ready for whatever comes, right? And have a robust justification for whatever we do.